vast number of people, even those approaching retirement age, have got nowhere near the the savings needed, not just to give them a you know reasonably comfortable lifestyle, but even almost you know to to, to survive, you know, for a very basic standard of standard of living. So that is a crisis. I'm John Sullivan with 401k Specialist, and this is the 401k Specialist Podcast. This week, we're joined by Jerry Baker, editor-at-large of the Wall Street Journal and author of the weekly Free Expression column. Baker previously served as editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones from 2013 to 2018 and has been a journalist for over 30 years. Our discussion touched on inflation, ESG, Bitcoin, and of course, retirement-related issues. Is retirement planning an art? Well, I think so. I help my clients reach their retirement goals. Whether those goals are far away or right around the corner, I help them get there. That's an art. And with T. Rowe Price's full suite of target date solutions, you can call me a Rembrandt of retirement. Retirement meet your match. Visit trowprice.com slash target date. Principal value of target date strategies is not guaranteed at any time, including at or after the planned retirement date assumed to be age 65. T. Rowe Price Investment Services, Inc. Jerry, as you've noted, history doesn't repeat itself, but there is a pattern in the ebb and flow of historical tides. Inflation and rising gas prices certainly have a 1970s feel. How closely can and should we make that comparison? John, I think the comparison can be overdone. Um, it clearly, looking at the numbers that we're seeing at the moment, we're nowhere near the kind of hyperinflation that we really got into in the 1970s. Now, of course, you know, uh, it has to start somewhere, and it started somewhere. It really started in the 1970s. It started actually in the 1960s um, with a huge increase in government debt, with um, uh, with the expansion after the Vietnam War. And then, of course, uh, that was then compounded in the 1970s by things like the oil price shock and various other things. We're not, we don't have that scale of um, incipient financial uh, economic crisis uh, right now. But I do think we should be aware of those um, of those factors back then that led to that inflation, because we do have some similarities. We are expanding the government debt enormously. Um, we'll see what happens, obviously, with this latest uh, attempt uh, by the Democrats to get yet another big spending bill through in Congress. But but we've already seen, um, you know, the, the, the debt uh, has exploded in the last year, uh, two years in any case, and that can be inflationary. We've seen that in the past, and of course we have got bottlenecks. I mean, and again, you know, in the 1970s there were. Uh, huge. There was an energy uh, shock and an energy crisis, which led, of course, to escalating inflation as well. But we've seen something similar with the um, with the kind of recovery from COVID, uh, with huge bottlenecks around the world caused by the uh, by by the pandemic, and that's pushing up prices too. The, the the real fear, the risk is there are two risks. I mean, one is the extent to which the the Federal Reserve um, validates the uh, inflation uh, and, in other words, enables the inflation, which it did in the 19, late 60s and 70s. And I think, again, there's some evidence that the Fed is being, taking a very tolerant attitude at the moment. Some might even say complacent. Um, and then the other facet is the extent to which it, the, these, these price movements become embedded in expectations. And that's when things really can take off and go, go, go in a very bad spiral. Because if people, if investors and consumers and Wage earners and unions, if they expect prices to be rising at three, four, five, six, seven percent, they're going to embed that in their own decisions, in their own investment decisions, in their own pricing decisions, in their own wage negotiations, and that's when things can really get out of hand. So, so we're not anywhere near where we were in the nineteen seventies, but I do think there are um, factors that that are happening today that that, that do have uh, antecedents from that time. Are you a fan of investment strategies that incorporate ESG or environmental, social, and governance principles? And in your opinion, was the business roundtable right to embrace them? Look, ESG is, has become um, absolutely ubiquitous in uh, investing, and in many ways, um, whatever what I, what I think about it or what anybody else thinks about it is kind of irrelevant. If you have a company like BlackRock, um, you know, the world's largest uh, asset manager. Uh, saying that it will uh, it will apply these ESG principles very very uh, rigorously to its investing practices, then you know the rest of the world simply has to follow on. I'm a little skeptical. That's, that's having said that, I'm a little bit skeptical. Look, of course, um, we are moving. The whole world is 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 very focused on climate change. Policymakers are focused on it. Investors are focused on it. We are, companies are, are, are aggressively moving, uh, along with governments, aggressively moving to you know, to reduce carbon emissions. And actually, we're having some success with that. The US, in particular, uh, has has seen a significant reduction in carbon emissions per head in the last twenty years. Western Europe has been the same. So you know, so I, so I think 
so it's understandable. It is. It's it's understandable that this looms very large in any investing uh, climate, if you'll forgive the pun. But um, I I do worry a little bit that sometimes. I mean, I worry about two things. One, I think that too much emphasis on, especially on the S and the G of of, of ESG, that is social and gov- governance. I think too much emphasis on that can distract um, companies from what their ob- fundamental objective should be. The, 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 the fundamental objective of a company should be to make money for its for its owners, for its shareholders. Um, now, I think you can do that and, and meet some other objectives at the same time. But if you put those other objectives first, then you are going to risk – uh, undermining the purpose of the firm, of the company, and actually in the long run, obviously undermining its return. So I do worry about that. I do think there should be, I, I wish we could go back to a, a world in which companies were more focused um, on shareholder, on immediate shareholder returns, and much less focused on some of these rather sometimes very nebulous goals. I mean, I think one of the problems, one of the many problems with the ESG or impact investing is, and, the, and you mentioned the, um, you know, well, the business roundtable and the, the idea of um, stakeholder society is these are very vague and general terms. I mean, at least when when a, when a when a when the managers of a company are focused on shareholder value, they can be their performance can be measured and they can achieve that shareholder those those objectives for shareholder value or not when you're talking about improving society or doing something to um you know to 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 to, to raise awareness of issues of social justice and things like that you know they're not really first of all they're not completely within a within a, a firm's control and secondly they're a very vague and very nebulous set of objectives so so i think i i think look of course there's a role of course environmental considerations that play an important role in investing but i think it, we would be better off Companies would be better off focusing on on uh, maximizing shareholder value and leaving those larger social, political, cultural and questions to policymakers and in, ultimately to the people. We know you were at the SALT conference and we recently spoke with Anthony Scaramucci about his push into Bitcoin. What is your opinion of cryptocurrencies? Look, I'm not an expert, so please, you can, your listeners should not uh, t- take anything that I say with any, any anything more than just as a, as a passing observation. Look, I think I, I, I clearly there is, I shouldn't say clearly, I, I suspect I go along with those who think that perhaps the current kind of mania for, for cryptocurrencies may be, may be just that, maybe slightly overdone. And, and the volatility that you see in the prices of some of these uh, assets is just absolutely extraordinary. And I think that's, uh, that, that, should, that gives us a signal, I think, at least that maybe um, there is um, what's up. <coughs> This, these 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 uh, assets are not these cryptocurrencies are not always supported by, uh, if you like, kind of economic or financial fundamentals. So so that would so that would concern me. And but that said, it is a huge market. I mean, the the, you know, the valuation now of these cryptocurrencies is now enormous. I do and I do find something um, plausible about the argument that cryptocurrencies, along with blockchain, by the way, and in a, in a, uh, alongside that, represent a kind of bottom-up approach to um, to finance, to, uh, to, to a form of money that is that is essentially bottom-up. And I think that as people fear what governments do, whether and, and the inflationary effect that, that, that um, governments can have uh, when they print too much money, uh, and the traditional forms of money, currency, or indeed other, other form of assets, can be can be devalued. So I do understand why there is a, um, a search for alternatives, and I would certainly not criticise anyone for, for for looking for looking for those alternatives. I just do wonder at the moment whether there isn't. I mean, this is whether there are elements of this that are just that are very much a speculative bubble. Debt and spending are on everyone's mind, and several former Treasury secretaries sent a letter to Congress urging them to raise the debt ceiling. Should it be raised, or is Mitch McConnell right to block it? it this is a this is a thorny question. Um, look, the, the, there's no question that the um, the amount of federal debt that's increased in the last well I, over a long, you know I, I'm old enough to remember when the government was running a surplus actually back 20 years ago, and everybody worried then. I remember Alan Greenspan testifying before Congress, worrying that the government uh, running a surplus was going to take up uh, more and more of financial markets, and that was a problem. Well, that was a problem that didn't last very long. We've had an explosion of debt, obviously, you know, in the last four years, but particularly in the last uh, two years, last year and a half, as a result of the pandemic, and then as a result of these policies from this administration. Um, I think that's worrying, and I and I sympathise with Republicans who think that simply to raise the debt limit is somehow to to validate that and to facilitate uh, the increase in debt. And I think that they're right to stress that there should be measures taken um, to reduce the debt before they agree to it. That said, um, 
this is that's a blunt blocking an increase in the debt limit is a blunt instrument um and if that were to happen we know the turmoil that would cause in financial markets so i suppose I, a favored solution i would have is maybe you know real uh, plausible um measurable efforts to rein in the debt um again that seems very unlikely at the moment given where democrats are trying to go but with a you know with a limited with a with a limited increase in the debt limit to avoid a financial crisis recent retirement savings legislation is popular bipartisan and needed it would seem an easy win for all involved but why does it take so long to pass is it simply congressional bandwidth i think there's an element of that look i think also um there is, uh, you know, there, there not a lot gets passed these days in, in, in Congress. I mean, the partisanship uh, problem is so great that a lot, uh, that, that um, especially in the Senate, where you can't get most things done without sixty majority, without sixty votes, that's you know put, puts puts a lot of pressure on a lot of uh, measures that would be uh, desirable. I think also there is a sense of um, there probably is a, a lack of a sense of with 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 retirement provision. Um, that is always something that that can be kind of put off for another day. I think, in, I mean, it can't, it shouldn't be, but that always in in the minds of members of Congress, I think it's often something that doesn't doesn't doesn't, doesn't meet the immediate standards of crisis or immediate uh, obligation or need. So I think it's easy for them to kind of punt it, um, and you know we're just seeing more of that right now. Do we have a retirement crisis in this country, or is it overblown? No, I think we do. I mean, the, the problem is, it's. It, uh, you know, I'm contradicting myself. We, uh, from what I just said, I think we do. I think if you look at the underfunding of um, pensions, or you know, from an individual basis. I mean, I haven't. You'll you'll be familiar with the latest data, but I, but I, some of the data that I've seen is scary, is terrifying, and you know, most vast number of people, even those approaching retirement age, have got nowhere near. The, the savings needed not just to give them a you know reasonably comfortable lifestyle but even almost you know to, to, to survive you know to, for a very basic standard of standard of living so that is a crisis um again i, I to, to just to sort of clarify what i was saying um it, it's not seen as a crisis you know because it, because again it, refer, it because it because it because it's about something that is 10 15 20 years away say for most people members of congress i think don't necessarily respond very well to something that looks like that kind of a challenge but it is. I think. I think. I think it is. I think. It, I think it is a crisis, and I think. I think you know measures have got to be taken to um, to address it as quickly as possible. Jerry, that's exactly what we needed. Thank you so much for joining us. I do appreciate it. John, thanks very much for having me. Is retirement planning an art? Well, I think so. I help my clients reach their retirement goals, whether those goals are far away or right around the corner. I help them get there. That's an art. And with T. Rowe Price's full suite of target date solutions. You can call me a Rembrandt of retirement. Retirement meet your match. Visit tRowPrice.com slash target date. Principal value of target date strategies is not guaranteed at any time, including at or after the planned retirement date assumed to be age 65. T. Rowe Price Investment Services, Inc.